Okay, as an exercise to think more deeply about how recursion really works, we're going to look at two variations on recursion, tail recursion and embedded recursion. Most of the stuff we've written so far has been embedded recursion. The key thing is going to be, are there any function calls waiting for the recursive call to return? If so, it's embedded recursion. Otherwise, nothing is waiting on it, nothing is dependent upon it, it's tail recursion. Let's look at regular or embedded recursion. So our factorial calls 4 times fac of 3, which calls 3 times fac of 2, which calls 2 times fac of 1. We in CS60 think about each of those being executed by one of these stuffed dogs. And this first one says, oh, I'm responsible for a fac of 4, and I have to wait for a fac of 3 to be done so I can multiply their answer by 4. So that one at the very top is just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. This one at the bottom says, we are done just because I finished my work. Okay, so when we get to fac of 1, we know that that call is done. It returns 1 because we hit our base case. But the key idea is that the base case is not the end. Fac of 1 returns its answer to fac of 2. Fac of 2 returns its answer to fac of 3. And finally, fac of 4 gets its answer. Okay, so it's this idea of they're waiting for each of the next recursive calls to execute and return their value. The alternative is something called tail recursion. So here I've written a new factorial, and it has two arguments, which is a little weird. But the idea that is that for each one, it's not going to have to wait for the one, next one to return. At the end, I get to fac of 1 and 24, and this one can just return 24. So again, the idea is once you make the recursive call, there's nothing left to do. Here's some starter code for that fac that takes in these two arguments. And I've run trace on the right-hand side. So highlighted in blue, you can see the three calls I made, fac of 1, 1, fac of 4, 1, fac of 6, 1. And then the purple-ish text shows what recursive calls get made based upon that. My starter code on the left, I've written some uh, basic input checks for you. So to make sure if it's not an integer, say expect a number, and if it's less than one, say expect a positive number. So I want you to pause the video and try and write this version of fact. And you could use the trace from the right hand side to try and figure out what's the pattern, what's going on here. Hopefully you've paused the video, but now let's look at it. Okay, in each of the three cases on the right, when I get down to that first input being a one, I return that second input. Okay, that's kind of cool. It seems like that could be a base case for me. So if n equals one, then I'm going to return that second input, which is answer. Okay, otherwise, what's my recursive case? Otherwise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that second argument, answer, by n. Check through the examples on the right. Look, every time the second argument is just whatever the old second argument was multiplied by the old n. And then we can see the n in between each row just decreases by 1. Okay, so I've written out what I just explained on the last slide uh, in brackets. So that's down at the bottom. And then I have those three traces up at top. A little piece of vocab is the variable answer. This is often called an accumulator. So again, once we get to n equals 1, we return answer. And otherwise, we're going to call fac again with a new value for n, that'll be n minus 1, and a new value for answer, that'll be n times answer. So the key thing is for tail recursion versus embedded recursion, are there any function calls waiting for the recursive call to return? If yes, it's embedded recursion. If no, it's tail recursion. So let's look at this. In our original version of factorial, we were waiting for that fact to return because we needed to multiply the answer by n. And in this new version where we use tail recursion, nothing was waiting for fact to return. So once we delegated to the next recursive call, we weren't necessary anymore. There was no additional calculation that we needed to do. Okay, that second argument is like a little bit ugly. So a really common thing in tail recursion is to write something like a wrapper. So here I have this fact public where someone just passes in one argument because that's what makes sense for factorial. And then I can pass it along to fact that takes in two inputs. And so each time I'll start answer at one. In summary, in tail recursion, in the recursive case, we just return the recursive call. There's no other calculations that have to happen. This is the defining feature. You usually need an extra argument to keep track of your answer. Because of this extra argument, you're also going to want a helper function. This wrapper function can be helpful. You really don't want your user to have to know about that extra argument. Like that wouldn't make sense and they could pass in the wrong value. Not good. So we want that wrapper. And last, typically your base case returns your answer. 